Thank you everyone for joining us. Uh, we have a panel that I'm personally very passionate about. Uh, I know Aubrey's been passionate about it as well. You've heard the uh, term that he's used about core foundations and tech foundations. And this is an area I think I've been passionate about because as I play in the securities market, you know, you can't really throw anything through until the infrastructure is built. And as you're building the infrastructure, you really have to think about what am I building on? What are the core principles and what are the tech foundations uh, that the infrastructure is being built on? So we've accumulated a really great panel here. Um, I begged some of them to come uh, and, and, and they did. Uh, and, and I'm very happy about them. So let me introduce them. Um, I guess I don't have my notes in, in order, so I, I, I would go down and say, Alec, also known as Zero Age, is the lead technical developer for Zeppelin's transaction permission layer, TPL. It's very cool. It's a, pro, uh, it's a protocol for assigning metadata to Ethereum addresses that, among other use cases, enables security tokens to ensure regulatory compliance before performing token transfers. He's also, a, he's also a contributor to Ethernaut, a popular educational site where players try to find smart contract vulnerabilities in a series of war games. Um, next to him, we have Mason. I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a fanboy of Mason's, as, as everybody knows. He's the CEO of Tokensoft. Tokensoft is a technology platform that enables small businesses, enterprises, and institutions to meet compliance requirements for blockchain-based securities at issuance, distribution, and exchange. He's one of the principal authors of ERC-1404. Yeah, Mason, that was kind of lame. He's really good. He has, he has <laughs> so much knowledge um, in, in the space. He, you know, he knows so much more than a lot of lawyers know. He has paid a lot of attention to his tech. Uh, he's really a true expert. I, I begged him to come on this thing. Uh, next to him, we have Rachel. Rachel, Rachel specializes in strategy and product. She's the global lead for financial services at Hedora Hashgraph now, where she identifies, maps, and advocates for critical applications of distributed ledger technology across banking, capital markets, loans, payments, and remittance. Prior to that, she led regulatory strategy for Polymath, which is a blockchain startup and tokenization technology platform, and spearheaded their initiative to form an industry standard for tokenized securities, which eventually would have turned into the ERC-1400 movement. And next to her is Tomo. Tomohiro is the CTO of AnyPay. AnyPay is a big deal in Japan. They're based in Japan and Singapore, and they've been offering ICO advisory service for about a year. If you ask people out in Japan, they usually think that they're number one. Uh, after a while, they start developing a couple applications for issuing and investing on security tokens. Their system will offer tools for dividend distribution to investors following SDOs, as well as investor relations and uh, communications management tools. Last but not least, sometimes they say last, not least, but definitely last. <laughs> <laughs> Boris is the director of partnerships at Interstellar, a company that commercializes projects on Stellar, where he runs the asset issuance business. In this capacity, Boris seeks to usher in a new era of tokenized securities and to foster an ecosystem that is home to a diverse array of high quality assets. So we've accumulated a quite a diverse spectrum of folks that can talk about multiple chains, multiple different technology layers uh, on top of different chains. Uh, and I'm really excited about this. Uh, I, I hope you enjoy. So one of the fundamental requirements of technology underlying security tokens is this concept of scalability. Uh, you know, I, I've, I've been doing most of my work in Ethereum and Boris has been spending a lot of time explaining to me why there are some limitations to Ethereum, and one of them is you know, the current state of scalability. So can you talk to us about scalability, why that's important as a fundamental uh, tech foundation of security tokens? Yeah, absolutely. So you know, scalability has been at the top of mind uh, for, for people in the space for several years now. Um, and what's important to understand is that there's an inherent trade-off uh, between decentralization and performance as it relates to throughput and scalability. Uh, as far as you know, blockchains are, con are concerned, um, it, it's important to think about what is the blockchain optimized for? What's it built for? Um, I think Ethereum is, is a very powerful platform that, that can do many things that 
uh, were not possible before, but it's, it's not necessarily optimized for throughput or transaction processing. Uh, and so other ones Stellar included were designed for that purpose. Uh, and so, uh, you know, they can push the scalability um, threshold a little further. Um, but still, if you're talking about securities and high frequency trading, there's no blockchain in the world that can process that kind of throughput. Um, to some extent, that, that's not uh, a huge concern because most trading occurs on centralized exchanges where the limitations uh, of the actual blockchain don't apply as much. But still, you want to make sure that if there's peer-to-peer -peer trading going on um, or there's a depositor withdrawal, you're not encumbered by a blockchain that is uh, full, for example. If, if there's a, a dApp that takes off, where people are, are trading digital cats, you don't want uh, you know, to be unable to um, withdraw or deposit uh, funds into, uh, into a securities exchange. Right, Rachel, can you maybe add to that and, and maybe talk about proof of work, proof of stake, et cetera, and, and talk about scalability. And, you know, you're at Hashgraph and you, know, you guys have you know, come up with an approach to address scalability. Um, sure, so uh, along the lines of scalability for throughput, you also have scalability of resources that are required to reach consensus to power the network. And proof of work and proof of stake each have their own cost and benefit, you know, pros and cons. Uh, proof of work works well in the sense that you do commit a lot of resources in order to say this is the right response, this is what we have come up with. But because of that, we have this issue that Bitcoin has really come to light. You can't have a very scalable network um, if it's not just focused on store value, if you want to put businesses on it, if you want to power securities and capital markets on it, that takes up more energy than Iceland. Um, so proof of stake is a useful tool to do this where uh, you weigh the, um, you weigh the relevance of the nodes that are confirming consensus via their amount of skin in the game. Uh, so that helps with scalability as well. I think Boris did a great job covering a lot of the other aspects. <laughs> Let, let's talk a little bit about reliability, reliability and integrity. Uh, Mason, maybe you can you know, give us your thoughts about, you know, you know, obviously those are core elements of uh, security infrastructure. They need to be reliable and have integrity. Uh, maybe you could give us an idea, you know, some idea of how the tech foundations on that are built. Uh, yeah, so I, I think um, w one thing that, that I'm noticing is everyone's sh shifting from the old world of cryptocurrency to, to security tokens is um, there were a lot of lessons that we learned um, as we uh, watched all these uh, exchanges get, get hacked or these wallets get hacked. Um, and, and that comes down to sort of the security. And so uh, we built all this, all this resilience up. And uh, now that we have a new way of, of, of tech being built, <laughs> Um, it's also important to take those lessons and carry them into sort of the next phase of, of, of the world of, of, of crypto and security tokens. And, um, and so uh, there's, there's just a lot of techniques that um, I, I think it's, we may have to learn some of these lessons over and over again. Um, but there are a lot of techniques we learned in, in helping keep these uh, exchanges uh, sort of resilient and having very, um, very secure process, operational processes around moving money. Um, and, and I think as, as we move into security tokens, um, these tokens that are trading are going to be under the same risks. You know, what if, what if something is, is trading doing a few hundred million dollars in, in, in volume uh, and, uh, you know, it gets hacked? What's that going to do to the, to the security token? So um, I think there's, there's a lot of risks and challenges uh, as, as we move forward, but hopefully a lot of the lessons will also be carried over. Um, Alec and Tomo, do you guys have any, you know, addition input on kind of the cybersecurity and security risk kind of crypto and basically essentially the security token ecosystem? Sure. Um, yeah, security is, of course, kind of more, one of the most important factors when using blockchain because if there is a security issue or threats, then no one ever wants to use it. Um, there can be um, some layers of the security, I guess. Uh, one is the security in the blockchain itself. Um, if the, for example, if the blockchain is blockchain the miners are occupied by um, a single uh, bad guy uh, for the more than the 50 percent, then they can control the blockchain transactions. And the other layer is uh, smart contracts, uh, which we will discuss later. But um, so smart contracts concept is basically a do-it-yourself basis. So there can be uh, if if 
if the developer makes a bug in our smart contract, there's no way for the blockchain itself to revert the transaction. Um, so, um, so the, for the for former case, uh, it's important to use the popular blockchain like Ethereum because uh, they have a number of um, honest miners. And the other layer is um, for the other layer, uh, we want to use uh, code audit uh, before there is the code production as the, we do for the web servers or uh, ordinal uh, systems. Yeah, I, I agree with all of those points. And uh, auditing code is incredibly important when you're dealing with smart contracts and uh, blockchains in general. Um, and that involves not only reading and understanding the code, running all the tests you can, but also extending that to formal verification where possible, and also utilizing really well vetted standards and uh, widespread approaches, and also uh, employing a modular architecture so that if one piece of your code uh, has a vulnerability, you can isolate that. Well, if anyone would know it would be you and your firm. So um, let's, let's talk, you know, now that we've covered just a few of the you know, core kind of principles that are important in uh, security tokens, uh, let's talk about some of these chains and some of these technologies. Uh, Tom, can you just kind of give a background, you know, what is Ethereum, why is it, or how is it significant for security tokens? Sure. Uh, so Ethereum went live back in uh, 2015. And uh, found uh, one of the founders named Vitalik, and he wants to make a world computer, um, and it's Ethereum. And you can write code and deploy it to blockchain, and it's called smart contracts. And the, one of the types of the uh, smart contracts are called token, and which um, you may have heard of the word called uh, ERC20, uh, which defines the uh, commonly used function transfer. So you, you can, you can, you, uh, you, you want to call transfer function to send tokens to one from, uh, from one account to another. So by agreeing the, uh, that function's interface, you can um, uh, uh, players including the primary issues or secondary exchanges, uh, platforms can um, just call the uh, transfer function to, um, we can write a program to meet complicated um, requirements for security tokens. So, you know, so Alex, maybe you can tell us a little bit about TPL, very interesting project. Sure, yeah, TPL uh, stands for Transaction Permission Layer. Uh, it's a way to tie in real world information uh, and assign it to, in this case, Ethereum addresses, although it can be extended to other chains uh, without too much difficulty. Um, it operates on the abstraction of a digital jurisdiction, which delineates the different parties that are at play. Namely, you have um, the participants in a jurisdiction, and then you have validators, which will assign attributes to those parties, and uh, then all of the various implementers, which would include securities tokens and enable securities tokens to enforce uh, transfer restrictions based on KYC, AML, accredited investor checks, really the sky's the limit. Um, and then also, uh, there was, there's a governance entity that basically administers the validators and assigns which validators can uh, issue which attributes. Um, we just launched our uh, first version of the, the code, and it's all open source. And uh, our main objective and priority is uh, much, much like uh, Fabian's great talk. Uh, we're all about interoperability and shared standards and uh, open protocols. So it, that way it promotes uh, wide usage across a bunch of different fields and uh, encourages lots of eyes getting on it and developing really secure and efficient ways of doing this uh, in a sort of complementary way. Right. Mason, you know, I know you've got a, a securities organization platform that supports multiple chains. Uh, you're one of the few that support Corda. Can you talk a little bit about Corda and kind of how it differs? Uh, yeah, so one of, one of the things we really pride ourselves on is our uh, integrity and scalability. 
Um, the, the, the largest sale we did uh, brought in about 28,000 people um, through the, um, the compliance process. Um, and, and so um, one thing that's really important to us is that everything that we're building on is really enterprise grade and can handle very high throughput. And so as we started uh, looking at other blockchains, um, Stellar was actually the first one uh, that we uh, started supporting early this year. Um, and then uh, Corda, we, uh, we have a couple projects on Corda as well. And um, what, we re re what we really like about it is that um, it's a scalable platform, it's enterprise friendly, um, and uh, through a software uh, development platform called Cordite, it's really easy to do um, enforce governance or to uh, mint uh, various types of tokens and, and allow them to transfer. And so um, that's sort of just part of our commitment to uh, adhering to enterprise grade tools and providing the, uh, the best in the market. So Boris, you know, I can't go anywhere now without hearing about Stellar being like the new chain that one should consider on security tokens. Can you explain kind of why, how Stellar is a little bit different, some of its advantages, maybe some of its limitations? Sure. So Stellar is a distributed ledger protocol or uh, a blockchain that, uh, that allows institutions and issuers to represent any arbitrary value in, in the form of a token. Um, it, uh, it's been around for, for a while, since uh, 2014. Uh, the original idea was to allow financial institutions uh, and banks to issue tokens that represented fiat currencies of, of various different global currencies so that there could be one uh, ledger that you know, ushers in uh, a, a level of interoperability that isn't there, uh, that wasn't there before and, and still largely isn't there in the traditional um, cross-border payment space. Um, but then over time, you know, especially in the past two years or so, we've seen um, an increasing number of people that are representing not just fiat currencies, but also all sorts of real world assets as tokens uh, on the ledger. Uh, and so, as I alluded to previously, one of the main differences between Stellar and, and some of the other uh, platforms is that it was designed from the ground up to, to facilitate efficient transfer of value. So that's, that's really what uh, the, the system is, is designed to do, is, is process efficient transfer of value and exchange of value. And that's another one of the differences is that it, it includes a built-in uh, exchange that's part and parcel uh, of the protocol. Um, so you know, the pluses are fast uh, uh, throughput, uh, scalability, um, the, the drawbacks, are it's not, uh, there's no Turing complete smart contract scripting language, so it, it's, it's limited in terms of which use cases are well suited for Stellar. So, you know, you wouldn't want to go build a decentralized prediction algorithm uh, on Stellar, for example, but to represent, uh, you know, fractional ownership of real estate and facilitate its exchange, it's, it's quite a good platform for that use case. All right, Rachel, you guys are the new kid on the block. Fresh off a you know very large and successful capital raise, what is Hashgraph? How is it going to be significant for security tokens? Uh, okay, um, I'm the new kid on the new kid on the block, so you're going to have to be patient with me. Hopefully, I get this right. Um, so Hashgraph, Hedera Hashgraph, is a distributed ledger. Um, we don't happen to be a blockchain. Architecturally, we're a directed acyclic graph or a DAG. Um, more on that later. You can find me. Um, so what I, how I like to look at it is we're, we're really two things. One is a performant distributed technology, and then we're mature governance. And if you look into technology, uh, we prioritize three things. It's being fast, fair, and secure. Now, Boris mentioned earlier a trade-off between scalability and um, centralization or decentralization. What we find is it's scalability and security. And what we've done is we've put a stake in the ground and said we commit to being, uh, to having the gold standard for security in distributed ledgers. And this is not so much cybersecurity in the uh, you know, user side, but how, uh, how easy or hard it is to compromise your consensus. And so what we have is a synchronous Byzantine fault tolerance. And that speaks to uh, a resilience of a network if it's delayed or there are issues of communicating between nodes. And what it broadly means is you assume there are bad actors outside your network, within your network, and trying to get between. 
your network, which I think are pretty good assumptions for a, a network distribution layer. Um, so given that, what we've done is maximized our throughput, and our performance that we've achieved is um, around 100,000 transactions a second. And uh, we do it in what we maintain to be fair ordering. So that's a pretty big differentiator for us, um, something that uh, if we roll it back to security tokens, is, is lacking today. Uh, it's first in, first out. So the first order that comes to the network gets processed in that order, which uh, it helps with something like front running, for example. And on the mature governance side, um, this one is, is interesting because we are a open network, but we are not open source. And this was a very deliberate decision. Uh, again, speaking to its applicability in uh, securities, we view that forking is an interesting concept, but it does result in a lot of risk and a lot of trouble for uh, securities issuers. And you can imagine, particularly in a non-fungible token situation, where if all of a sudden you have two uh, you know, identical copies of a non-fungible token, that kind of defeats the purpose. So you have one that represents, uh, let's say, a title to an asset. Which one? if it splits into two, which one is the correct one? Uh, so that's kind of what we've done. Uh, so again, fast, fair, secure, uh, open network um, with the governance model that says no forking. And we uh, have voting from large enterprises that determines roadmap and features for the network. We think that's pretty great for capital markets and security tokens um, because it takes advantage of a network that has the capability to handle the throughput and the needs of capital markets. It has the um, stability that capital markets would require to run, and it has governance that keeps priorities uh, of business owners, issuers, regulators in mind. Great, great. Now, this question is kind of for anyone that wants to tackle it. Um, you know, the audience is not all technically oriented, uh, but this is kind of an important concept to understand, I think. Um, what's the difference between Uh, I'll jump in. Basically, <coughs> it's expensive to use the most public chains uh, to varying extent and depending on demand. It's also very public, uh, totally auditable. So if you can avoid writing to chain uh, and doing things off chain or doing things in a side chain or a plasma chain, it's often beneficial and more scalable in an organic way. Um, that's sort of known as layer two solutions. Layer one being uh, improvements to the throughput of the underlying system. Um, some solutions to that include the use of state channels. Um, Vitalik has a great analogy for that. It's if I go to the, the coffee shop every morning um, and I write you a check for my coffee, five bucks, now you want to go cash that check every day, but the bank charges a fee that's all of a sudden going to eat into my margins. What if I write you a check for $5 for my coffee today, then tomorrow I come back, write you a check for $10, and we rip up the old check, and we have a, a system like that. And there's obviously a lot more nuance to it than that, but you can basically have an open channel where you transact off-chain and then just refer back to the original chain for settlement. Uh, side chains and plasma chains are uh, another set of technologies for linking chains together. Um, you can lock up tokens into a smart contract that a plasma chain will then refer to, and it can run on a centralized server or just a server without the same security assurances. And if there's any trickery, then you can cash out and pull out. Um, so there's, there's a lot of interesting proposals for how you can just treat the base layer as the, the dispute resolution or uh, sort of arbitrator of last resort, but uh, push most of your, your transaction volume into these second layer solutions. But it's meant to really work in concert. Anyone else? Anyone else? Um, 
so as Alec mentioned, uh, Alec mentioned about layer two and off-chain uh, scalability improvements. And um, so the layer two is easier because uh, layer one, I mean a base chain or called a uh, root chain, is harder to uh, just uh, change the behavior because they have many miners and token holders. But uh, some uh, improvements are uh, ongoing. For example, in you know, Ethereum, uh, Ethereum is based on the proof of work uh, consensus algorithm, which is uh, you know time consuming and uh, energy consuming. But uh, they they try to move to the uh, proof of stake or delegated proof of stake, which doesn't uh, consume the time or energy um, to uh, make the scalability improvement. Great. Mason, can you, you know, there's been a lot of talk. Yeah, so a, uh, a permissionless, uh, do you mean uh, permissionless smart contracts or do we want to operate at the chain level? Uh, it, yeah. Okay, so uh, I, I guess let's, let's just think of it as, as a, a transfer in general, a tra transfer of an asset in general, whether it's a cryptocurrency like, like Bitcoin or Ethereum or it's a, a token uh, built on top of Ethereum. And um, the good thing about keeping these things uh, permissionless is with, with something that, like, like Bitcoin that's a store of value, um, it's valuable because it's, it's fungible and you can, you can move it at any time. Uh, there's no intermediary, no one to potentially take it away from you. And uh, that's what you want for a, a store of value like that. You want to be able to go cash it out if you need tomorrow. Um, you want to be able to, to send it around as necessary. Um, as, as we're sort of maturing into the world of, uh, of, of securities, um, those properties uh, do a little bit more harm, harm than good. And so what's becoming uh, more common is these uh, sort of permissioned protocols um, for moving, uh, moving assets. And if we do want to launch an asset in the world of securities and adhere to all the laws, then we need uh, more of a permissioned um, uh, mechanism. And so we recently launched a standard for this. It's called uh, ERC-1404, and, and we're using that to actually implement the relevant uh, banking laws and securities laws um, when issuers want to move their, trans move their assets uh, during trading. Um, so I, I think these are probably going to be more and more common. Um, but the, uh, the value in, in having these, these be permissioned is um, the issuers of these assets do have a little bit more control over it. Um, so if they do need to revoke these tokens um, because maybe they went into the hands of you know, someone that's uh, perhaps on a sanctions list, they should be able to take that away. Um, there's other methods for, for dealing with that as well. But um, there, there's just more things that you need to do once you enter the regulated markets that permission standards help a lot more with. So, um, so on the cruise ride last night, you know, I was talking to a gentleman who was, was very passionate about thinking that permission blockchain was useless because why wouldn't we just use a you know, you know, private database as you know, we would today? So does anyone have thoughts on you know, a comment like that? Yeah, uh, so I, I think, uh, so if, if we look at just Bitcoin and Ethereum, fundamentally um, it's a network that operates 24-7, uh, pretty much with, with no downtime. Um, and uh, I, think, I think that, um, I forgot your question. <laughs> if you weren't going to use the public blockchain, it's going to be private. Oh, yeah. Why would you use the blockchain? Why so, so if we look at those characteristics, fundamentally, they're actually going to transfer as we build more and more infrastructure um, in the world of security tokens. So those things that were fundamentally possible before with, with Bitcoin and Ethereum are, are still going to be possible with security tokens. And uh, the, the primary feature is that we will be able to have markets that are open 24-7, uh, especially when we can automate a lot of the uh, rest transfer restrictions, a lot of the regulatory requirements around them. These things can now uh, operate and trade on a financial fabric that's globally accessible 24-7. And so I think you can build that in a private database, but I think there's, there's something different about being able to operate on open networks, and it, it creates a different mentality. If, if we did go down the sort of private database uh, model, then everyone would, it would be about you know, making your own database and, and, and having the standard and being, uh, being sort of the center. 
Um, but with an open network, anyone can plug in, and there's, there's essentially less ego um, to operating in a uh, sort of globally accessible fabric than there is with you know, operating on a, on a private database that can uh, perhaps do the same, uh, pr provide the same functionality. Uh, to add to that, Jor, I think um, a permission network versus a private database does have uh, an element of collaboration to it. So say you are one insurance company. You may have a private database. You probably do have one, in fact. Um, and you have all your client data, your risk data, whatever you use to, to manage your business day to day there. But what you could benefit from is sharing some of that data because your clients might jump from insurance provider to insurance provider with other people in your industry. That doesn't necessarily mean you want your transaction volumes or because or, really that's all you, you see on a public network. Maybe you're not trusting the technology yet. Maybe you're not ready to make that full leap. With a permission network, every node, every participant in that network is known to you and is, is part of your, uh, let's call it a vetted circle. Um, but that is one step removed from opening up your private database to letting maybe competitors um, visit around. And it's between that and having an open network where you share the same highways, if you will, as uh, everyone else. Um, Tomo, maybe let's, let's talk about fungibility a little bit. Um, because you know, that's always a discussion that comes up with security tokens. Can you kind of describe why that's significant? Uh, and maybe give some thoughts you know, on fungibility? OK. Um, so fungibility is kind of difficult problem because uh, there can be a debate if the US dollars are fungible or not because uh, it's censored by the uh, central banks. Um, but at least uh, they are exchangeable. Um, basically, cryptocurrencies are also fungible unless uh, programmed otherwise. Uh, if, if, the, you, if you call on a smart contract that it is um, non-fungible, you can do that. But um, basically, um, the cryptocurrencies are on the public pro uh, uh, fun uh, yeah, fungible. Um, and then Rachel, I, you know, you and I have talked for like two years about identity management and things like that. Um, can you talk about you know identity, you know why that's important, why that's you know, a core foundation of security, uh, and maybe some, kind of some of the technical challenges or, or thought processes behind it? Uh, okay, so. This one, I feel like I'm, I'm so underqualified to talk about this. There's so many professionals in the room who probably know this more than I do. But securities, uh, when you combine it with distributed ledger technology um, and, and this whole history that Bitcoin especially has of, of you know, movement in, in dark markets and, and as, a, as a currency for payments and there's all this anti-money laundering issues involved around it, it's basically a very... Um, mobile form of cash. And without the identity component, it's, it's uh, very easy to fall into a category where it's used um, maybe not exclusively, but extensively in uh, funding you know, drugs or, or arms sales that are illegal and all sorts of things that not just regulators, but most people probably don't want too much of. You know, general terrorist financing stuff. Uh, identity helps because you can now tell that your, your uh, participants in your markets and your transactions are you know, known entities. Maybe they're banks, maybe they're uh, uh, corporations, maybe they're individuals transacting. But when you are able to raise your hand and say, even digitally, that this is me, this is the money I'm sending from point A to point B, it gives regulators and institutions a lot of um, peace of mind. Uh, just if you look from a bank standpoint, they get any kind of indication they're participating or facilitating money laundering, they risk losing their license, right? So the moment that's a risk, it's a really big risk they can't control. It's like, get me out of here. Not doing this anymore. So identity becomes a really big component. If we can lock down that, if we can put that and secure it in a way that is uh, interoperable, that we can move it across chains, that we are sure of someone's identity, even though it's one step removed from real life, then I think this, it could mean a lot of growth for this space. It could mean a lot of adoption. I don't know if that answers your question very well, actually. Yeah, no, I mean, the problem with identity, of course, is you know, a lot of, you know, you know, you can go and randomly create a wallet, and there's no idea to tied to that. And then when you try to transact with that wallet, then someone needs to maybe figure out who you are when you're using that wallet, and whether it's OK for you to use that wallet at that time for that transaction. But then what happens when you do the transaction 10 days later, or a year later, or 10 years later? You know, how did they 
now do that again? Should they do that again? Can they share that information? Mm -hmm. What standards do they share that information? These are some of the issues that the industry is all working on um, and trying to solve. You know, can someone control their own identity and choose what they want to share so that no one else controls their own identity? Uh, so it, it's a big problem that a lot of people have looked at. Um, and I don't think anyone's like perfectly solved yet. Yeah, so I mean, Hedera has a, a, a built-in layer. We call it the opt-in identity. Uh, system and, and it's it's an attestation protocol. Basically, we're saying you have a wallet and uh, a entity that is trusted, uh, whoever you would trust to say who you are, can say I vouch for this wallet being the account of Rachel or Jor. Um, and you can have multiple people do that. So you probably wouldn't trust it if I said this is Jor and I'm just some random girl. You know, no one knows who I am. But if I'm a bank or a government, uh, maybe you would. And maybe if I'm some issuer of a license, maybe if I'm a school saying that you graduated there. And all these elements can add towards uh, probability or assurance that this is the individual. It goes back to that and probability, because a year later, maybe you've lost a private key to that wallet, and you're not there anymore. Uh, so yeah, it's not a solved solution by any means, but hopefully we can work towards it. Right. We can't have a smart con uh, panel without talking about smart contracts. So Boris, maybe, uh, maybe you can um, talk about like, smart contracts, what they are, and why they're significant, uh, you know, in, in, as a tech foundation, and, and how they might interplay, you know, you know, when something might be, you know, on the chain versus smart contract versus, you know, a big second layer smart contract. Yeah. Um, so, a smart contract it was popularized uh, in the Ethereum ecosystem as a way to automate uh, the execution of uh, of a contract. Um, but I personally have a bit of a contrarian view on, on smart contracts. Um, you know, people get really excited about the term, and, and it is an exciting concept. And we've we've heard the term smart contracts uh, mentioned today in this room quite a bit. Um, and a lot of the excitement comes from the idea, especially in the securities token space, around the idea that you can get rid of a lot of the uh, manual uh, processes and the paperwork that's involved in setting up uh, securitizing an asset. Uh, and though that's true, doing that by the means of a smart contract comes uh, at a cost. And the, the downside of having a smart contract is that it comes with a lot of technical debt. Uh, and so in a lot of cases, my opinion is that you are replacing the, you know, the cost of manual process and paperwork with uh, difficult code that is arguably much more expensive to, to write. And then the important thing to keep in mind is that these smart contracts need to be maintained and managed over time. Uh, and these are not easy things to do uh, if it's hard-coded in, into a smart contract. And so what we've seen with some of the earlier smart contracts that were created for security uh, tokens is that they had to be, uh, it's called upgraded. They had to be uh, rewritten um, to make sure that they were compliant uh, with kind of the new understanding of how these tokens are traded. And so it's our view that uh, trading restrictions should actually be enforced uh, by an off-chain uh, rule set, by an off-chain signer service, so to speak. Um, and there are you know, crypto purists that will say, well, you know, that's not decentralized. But when, when you're talking about securities, you know, the, the concept of decentralization as it you know, pertains to Bitcoin goes out the window. You know, there, there are rules that mandate issuers to be able to revoke or, or freeze assets if there's suspicion of fraud, et cetera, et cetera. Um, that doesn't work in, in the decentralization uh, you know, thing that, that people were excited about with, with Bitcoin. And so uh, you know, I don't want to be repetitive, but you know, our view is that trading restrictions for security tokens should be um, enforced on chain and then let the chain itself do what it's good at, which is uh, facilitate the, the efficient transfer of value and keep track of who owns what. Well, I also think that if, there's, if there are open standards around how you write secure contracts with best practices and solid uh, fundamentals, that the attack surface does uh, reduce significantly. You've got a shared set of eyes on it. I also think that there's no reason that just because you're enforcing transfer restrictions on chain that you can't also do it off chain. And as a matter of fact, if you have well accepted standards like ERC 1400 uh, or specifically 1404 that enables 
the exchanges and uh, other interested parties to check and see if a transaction is going to work or not ahead of time, then it can really uh, ease integrations and uh, save the hassle of, of having to fire off transactions that may fail. I really think that as an issuer, having the additional assurances that it's impossible based on the rules that are built into the contracts to even make a non-compliant transfer is a really nice assurance. Uh, that doesn't mean that that should be the only way that you're enforcing transfer restrictions, but it's, that's great. And in terms of upgradability, uh, yes, smart contracts on Ethereum at least are immutable, which is a benefit in a lot of cases and has also resulted in some pretty serious blunders uh, where lots of money has been stolen or frozen or you name it. But there are new paradigms uh, of more granular permissions around ownership of contracts and uh, making contracts upgradable uh, in a way that you can stay compliant, you can uh, update your uh, regulatory changing regulatory environments. And uh, the way that basically works in effect right now is you have a proxy contract that's your address to the outside world. And then that refers back to other contracts in the, the system that may hold all the logic to the smart contract, may hold the data to the smart contract somewhere else. And they all might have different permissions and roles that are assigned to who can upgrade the contract. And then you just tell the proxy to point at a new logic contract or what have you. So I think uh, more work is definitely needed in terms of standardizing that as well, but uh, that'll open up a lot of new possibilities in terms of uh, keeping everything fresh. Yeah, I agree with Alex and what makes, uh, um, I agree with the um, status of approach as well, but what, what uh, makes ECM great is the community members, the size of the community. Uh, so the, uh, there's always a discussion about how to scale, how to make it more secure. That kind of discussion is always held on uh, public in the, on the GitHub. Um, so, um, yeah, um, yeah, as I mentioned, uh, the... Well, I think standardization is, you know, obviously it's been a, a hot topic recently. You know, you've got a number of folks that are have come out with you know similar functions, but they're all a little bit different. And you know, similar to what ERC20 did for Ethereum, we need something now for the security token industry. There is the concern right now of proliferation of standards. Like everyone's trying to throw out their own standard. Uh, some of them are trying to take credit for this standard and that standard. Um, and, and hopefully the community will you know uh, collaborate and you know whichever standard gets adopted is, is really going to be a win for the whole industry. Um, you know we're almost out of time, but you know. All we in the Security Token Academy is very focused on interoperability. So at least I have to ask, um, you know, what do you guys see as the current challenges in the interoperability? Yeah, everyone here on this panel has created some sort of technical uh, solution for the marketplace. And you've got to have other people work with you, uh, people that are already working with you, work with each other, and then maybe work with other chains. What are some of the challenges that you're seeing now? Anyone? Thank yeah, you. I feel that one of the big challenges is that every, a lot of players in the ecosystem are vying for each other's attention because they, you know, they want their implementation to, to be adopted. But I think in order for there to be real interoperability, we need more discussions where multiple parties are in the same room uh, that are trying to come up with something that works across the board. Is that something you can do, Aubrey? Um, you know, we've got 10 seconds left, so actually, no, we're over time now. So, uh, thank you very much for sitting through this panel. I hope that you